Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us this evening. Um, I do appreciate you coming out on a Thursday night for the meet and greets. It is actually really good. I've met a few people for the first time face to face, and it's really nice to actually see what people look like versus their phone voice. So then I can sort of picture you as I talk to you next time. So. Um, basically, this is a potpourri of cutaneous tumours in dogs and cats, a little bit of cytology, a few gross pictures. So cutaneous tumours in the dog and cat are pretty common. They're the most common tumour of the dog, so the most common cancer in the skin. And it's the second um, most common tumour in cats. In cats, by far and away, the most common tumour type is lymphoma of all different anatomic locations. In the dog, if you've got a, a skin tumour, 20 to 30% of the time it's going to be malignant. In a cat, it's much more likely to be malignant, more like 50 to 60% of the time. And this is why getting a diagnosis is relatively important. In the dog, it's good to remember that mast cell tumours can still feel like lipomas. Both of those are relatively easy to diagnose cytologically in practice. So my mantra is stick a needle in it. Um, I used to say to the students at OSU that no matter what it was, sticking a needle, a 25 gauge needle, into something one time is never going to hurt, whether it's a spleen, a heart. If you accidentally stick the heart, though, you should probably do something useful with the blood you get back um, or, or a tumour on the outside. By sticking a needle in something, I've never had um, anything disastrously go wrong. I have had a really nasty muscle tumour just not stop bleeding, but I don't think that was, we needed a diagnosis on that anyway, so I can't really, in, even in retrospect, um, figure out how we would have treated that differently. So of the most common, of, of the tumours in the dog, this is a list of all the tumours that were submitted for pathology. So this is the most common skin tumours seen in the dog. As you can see, the third one here is lipomas. Just trying to get my pointer going. So I really think lipomas actually are the most common skin tumour in the dog, but people don't submit them for pathology because you cut them out, they're fat, just chuck them in the bin. The only thing I'd like to ask of you is to actually chop them in half before you, chop, if you, if the, before you put them in the bin, if they're, especially if they're big, because that's where other tumours, soft tissue sarcomas, as well as mast cell tumours, can sort of hang out within a fatty lump. So by far, in a way, the most common cancerous type of tumour in the skin of dogs is mast cell tumours. Um, Perianal adenomas and carcinomas was the second, followed by sebaceous hyperplasia or adenomas, so those warts. I'll show you a few pictures of those. Histiocytomas, I was kind of surprised by that, but we all know they're a surgical emergency because if you don't chop them off, they're going to go away. <laughs> um, squamous cell carcinomas, melanomas, so cutaneous melanomas are, are slightly different to nail bed melanomas and oral melanomas, fibrosarcomas, and then basal cell tumours and hemangiopericytomas. Really, in your mind, I just want you to think of that as a low-grade soft tissue sarcoma. So it's just another classification that pathologists use because it's got a very distinctive histopathologic appearance. And then in the cat, the most common cutaneous tumours in the cat um, are the basal cell tumours. So that's actually benign. Um, surgical excision is curative. Mast cell tumours also behave, true cutaneous mast cell tumours in the cat also behave benignly. So we don't need to freak out too much or even particularly, they don't really, even if you grade them, it's not too different. The only thing that I will say is that um, splenic mastocytosis in a cat is more of a um, malignant condition. And so if you've got more than one mast cell tumour in the skin of a cat, we should really be doing an abdominal ultrasound and checking that it's not cutaneous metastasis from the splenic mast cell disease. Fibrosarcomas, and that sort of includes your injection site sarcomas, not as common in this country, but not, not, like it doesn't not exist. And actually just two weeks ago we had one here and um, that cat has never been overseas. So that was from some sort of injection that the, that cat received in Australia. Um, squamous cell carcinomas, they're more common in um, Australia and California, so places with lots of sunlight. Certainly not in upstate New York where I was last, well, two winters or three, win three winters ago. And sebaceous hyperplasia and adenomas again. I find that warts and sebaceous adenomas in cats are way less common. Um, and a little bit about the etiology of some of these. So sunlight is definitely one of the causative factors of squamous cell carcinomas, 
ventral abdominal hemangiomas and hemangiosarcomas and squamous cell carcinomas on the ventral abdomen of dogs. I used to say that ventral, truly dermal hemangiosarcoma and truly dermal squamous cell carcinomas are really uncommonly going to met. And in fact, I'd never seen it until recently. Um, Warren Davis out at Liverpool actually um, referred over a ventral squamous cell carcinoma in a bull terrier that had an abdominal lymph node metastasis. So that was really unlucky. Um, but when you get a true dermal hemangiosarcoma, it's not the same as a subcutaneous or as a splenic hemangiosarcoma. So usually they're confined the d to the dermis. And usually we're actually running out of skin in the ventral abdomen before the dog's going to experience a metastasis. There's a few skin tumours that are viral in origin, so papillomavirus in young dogs, fibropapillomas in young cats, and um, lymphoma in cats, um, and then vaccination induced in cats. So some common questions I'm going to ask an owner about a cutaneous tumour is how long has it been there? And that's mainly because there are some tumour types that biologic behaviour is predictive from the amount of time it's been there. So a mast cell tumour that's been there for three years is actually, while it's still a mast cell tumour, it's unlikely to behave aggressively. Not never heard of, but unlikely. And then a rapid change in appearance. So same with us, if we get a mole that changes in appearance, it may have gone from a pre-neoplastic lesion to a neoplastic lesion. Same in a dog or a cat. How fast is it growing? So rapidly growing fibrosarcomas, rapidly growing mast cell tumours are more likely to be a higher grade. History of other skin masses or tumours. So we recently had a little um, terrier that got referred over from, for a subcutaneous melanoma. Um, and it was in the sort of region of the prescapula lymph node. Got excised by the veterinarian. They sent it in for histopathology, and the pathologist actually said they suspected it was a lymph node metastasis. So then when we questioned the owner, a year ago, that dog had had a prior surgery at a different veterinarian, but chosen not to submit it for histopathology, and that was probably actually the primary tumour a year previously. Vaccine history, mainly because of um, vaccine-induced sarcomas, and travel history. So transmission... Transmissible venereal tumours, or TVTs, are not particularly common, but they're certainly reported in Darwin. And just recently, even, I've seen a few more dogs from Darwin. So just with people travelling, with people moving and bringing their pets with them, um, it's important just to be thorough. OK, so we like to body map. <coughs> um, medical records should ideally include a rough size of the tumour, Consistently, location and any other defining characteristics. Is it alopecic? Is it ulcerated? Um, and then we actually do a body map for our patients. And this is the main reason Andrew and I wanted a resident, because when you get those dogs that have 28 masses on them and you want to body map them, and then, we have to, well, then what we normally do is scan that, um, attach it to the dog's record in RxWorks and give the owner a copy. And that way when they feel a mass and they're like, oh, that's right, it got aspirated, it was a lipoma, and they can go back to their body map and check it. Or if they feel a new one, then they can bring it in to you for your, for your aspirate. Um, we aspirate a lot. Definitive diagnosis is certainly possible, especially with round cell tumours. I think it's a bit of a myth that sarcomas don't exfoliate. They can exfoliate pretty readily in reality. Um, so you can normally get some sort of idea Lipomas just beat up like water on a windscreen as soon as you squirt it onto the slide. So most of the time you don't even have to stain a lipoma to know that's what it is. It can provide misleading information. So infiltrative lipomas can look like normal everyday lipomas. Usually though they're pretty big, solid and within musculature. Um, and mast cell tumours can also present as inflammation. So you can aspirate, um, get inflammation, start the dog on antibiotics seems to get better for a while, but then flares up again. You aspirate again, and then normally you'd get a mast cell tumour. So generally, if we don't get a, a, a diagnostic sample, or we're wanting a grade, or we're trying to figure out what it is prior to surgery, we get a biopsy. And then our next question is an excisional or um, incisional biopsy. So biopsies, from my perspective, are always a, um, a balance between keeping the pathologist happy and the surgeon happy. 
So the pathologist is never really happy unless they get the whole animal. But that's <laughs> not really reasonable. So um, rather than using a true cut most of the time, because they're, they're quite um, small biopsies, we'll use a dome punch. I just incise, a, um, however, maybe a five millimeter or one or a 10 millimeter derm punch. I'll just incise over the top of the tumor just enough to get the derm punch in there and then close it because David's pet peeve is massive biopsy sites that he then, I then expect him to take out with his definitive surgery. Um, and then whether or not, and you can also just obviously use a scalpel blade. So an excisional biopsy might be um, appropriate if you're after something like, say it's on a limb and you're thinking that you're only going to get one chance at this and it's a soft tissue sarcoma on aspirate and you're not, maybe we should check out what grade it is. Because if it's a grade three tumour, then maybe we shouldn't be doing an amputation in this dog for a cure. But maybe you can get an excisional biopsy it, on it and then we can follow it up with metronomic chemotherapy. And that actually is giving us really nice results without such a radical surgery as an amputation. And then tumour markings. So this is one way to communicate with your pathologist. And when you send your sample off to the pathologist and it's usually, maybe it's quite big and you're concerned about one area in terms of margins, it's really important that you somehow mark that area. Because 99% of the time, it's not the pathologist even cutting. Your, your pathologist won't even see the gross sample. So when you call Dave Taylor or Steve Yeomans, they never even saw it in the formalin pot. So their techs processed that sample. So you need to communicate to the techs where they should be processing in order to look at the best margin for you, the most relevant margin. So if you're concerned about the deep margin, I would write in your thing, please concentrate on deep margin and then try and mark it because the problem is you chuck something in a formalin pot and it all comes apart. Um, and then you can actually mark it with a, a suture. You don't have to use tumour marking ink. But you can get tumour tumor marking ink from CH2. Just use a cotton bud, let it dry before you pop it in the formalin. And then if you've forgotten, but you can still pull it out of the formalin, mark it, and then put it back in the formalin. And sometimes the text will actually do that for you the other side. If you've marked it with suture, then they'll actually, they'll take it out of the formalin and they'll actually mark it at the vetnostic side. Because what will happen is sometimes um, your... Um, the, the histotech actually looking at it might actually sort of here and this is where Dave or Steve Yeomans is actually having a look at the margins but you are actually worried about the cranial margin so unless you communicate that they're not going to know and then this is just a slide of what it actually looks like underneath the microscope so the darker stains show up better yellow doesn't show up as much and you can see for example this one is a lot of fat before you actually hit the tumour so that's nice to have done that because especially with fat, it usually falls away. Um, regional lymph node evaluation, really no matter what tumour type it is, we try and assess the regional lymph node. Not all tumour types are going to metastasize to the regional lymph node, but it's, it's quite easy to do, even if it's a tumour type that doesn't necessarily always go there. Usually a CBC chem UA, especially if they're starting on additional therapy. It's quite fascinating how many have occult <coughs> urinary tract infections. And it's always nice to get a baseline protein too in their urine because a lot of our therapies may cause proteinuria. Thoracic radiographs and then tumour imaging. So we use a mixture of ultrasound, CT and MRI and it really depends on our region of interest. So the big three categories of cancer that I tend to, to group all cancers in are epithelial, round or mesenchymal. So the round cell tumours on cytology tend to break off, and this is an example of a mast cell tumour here. So you have that negatively staining nucleus compared to the really dark staining mast cells. Sarcomas can actually, so you can see here, this sarcoma is actually exfoliated quite readily. And then epithelial tumours tend to come off in sheets. So of our epithelial tumours, we've got a variety of different tumour types. Papillomas, um, Danny already mentioned, they're these cauliflower-like growths. She was talking about it in the case of on cyclosporin, that they're predisposed to these. And certainly young dogs, we think, with some sort of immunodeficiency are um, predisposed to them. 
Usually they regress on their own, but I've certainly seen some debilitating cases. There is an autologous vaccine um, that's produced in Minnesota, I believe, where basically you send them samples of the papilloma off the dog and then they mush it up and then you get it back and we inject the dog with it. Um, and azithromycin might also help. Fibropapillomas in felines are usually associated with um, barn cats and they're very similar actually to equine sarcoids and they've normally got a history of exposure to cattle. So not typical for Sydney. Um, canine squamous cell carcinomas is different on the skin than it is for the nail bed and oral, so similar to melanoma. So it's far more metastatic if it's an oral squamous cell carcinoma or a nail bed squamous cell carcinoma. And we get these sun-induced lesions, so trying to keep our pets out of the sun is important as us staying out of the sun. They can be proliferative, ulcerative, um, and digital squames have a much greater metastatic potential. Um, I saw this dog that came to me after amputation for chemotherapy for a presumed um, osteosarcoma, and certainly it was in the right location, proximal humerus, it was a Rottweiler, um, and radiographically it was absolute, absolutely looked like a primary bone tumour. So they amputated the limb, and on histology it was a squamous cell carcinoma. And two years previously that dog had had a digital amputation on the contralateral limb, um, for a squamous cell carcinoma. And that squamous cell carcinoma had skipped the lymph node, skipped the lung, and gone to the bone on the other side. So that's where I just go, cancer never reads the textbook. And I'm, I feel like I'm forever telling clients it's just so unpredictable. So this is just an example of um, solar-induced squamous cells as well as hemangiomas on the um, ventrum. And these little precancerous, I call them sort of precancerous lesions or their actinic lesions, the little red dots, you can actually treat them. Um, we either can use systemic peroxicam. I've had some success with that, 0.3 mg per kg, or Aldara cream, so a micromod. So yeah, that's actually human for basal cell carcinomas in people. Um, I tend to use it daily, and they don't tend to have much of a reaction. Danny was saying she normally does it four days on, three days off. Quite expensive. So I get them to use one sachet for three or four days because you only really need a tiny amount. Um, feline squamous cell carcinomas are really common and certainly I see way more here than in um, Cornell because Cornell never saw sunlight. Um, but there's, it's way easier to treat early. So I'm almost more comfortable treating a suspect squamous cell carcinoma of the nasal planum with strontium than leaving it alone, to be honest, just because it's so much easier to deal with it when it's that tiny thing rather than a face-eating tumour. So 30% of cats have multiple lesions, and certainly since I started doing the strontium here, I've probably seen two or three cats back for lesions that have occurred elsewhere. And I don't really know if I should pre-treat the light areas with radiation. I don't know that it can be prophylactic like that. Um, but they basically goes from a precancerous lesion through to a cancerous lesion, and it's usually very locally invasive, but not metastatic. And then we have um, this sort of when you're presented with this sort of a picture, they because they can they can certainly start off tiny and then become rapidly progressive. So this can sort of start out as a, just a little ulceration, and then honestly, within four to six weeks, can be this nasal. Um, plain and completely gone. When it's something this big, you can certainly treat with surgery, um, but you would then need to follow it with something like external beam radiation. Um, and you can actually get a not terrible result, but it's a $10,000 job by the end of it. So other options besides surgery include the strontium that I was talking about. I've got a picture of that. Cryotherapy. Um, carboplatin may have some benefit, as well as um, external beam radiation therapy. Photodynamic therapy hasn't really taken off. Basically, that's where we inject the patient with a photodynamic, um, sort of a precursor agent, and then you actually zap the area with laser light that you want the precursor agent to become um, activated in. But it's not very clinically available still. So the really nice thing about strontium is it takes um, about six minutes and three or four seconds 
Um, essentially, my strontium probe is slowly losing its activity over time. It's got a birth date. I think it was born in 1987. And so the spreadsheet ca calculates for me exactly how many seconds needs to be applied to deliver 150 gray to the cat's nose. It's usually one treatment. We can do multiple sites. The probe's about a centimeter across. So I can just, I, we basically mark it and then move on to the next field. Um, but it only penetrates about three millimeters. So it's good for those superficial squames. And we actually did one dog on its ventral abdomen and it's gone really well. Um, I didn't know how that was gonna go, but it did take a long time because our little one centimeter probe took a long time to do a lot of the lesions. Sometimes when it's a bit thick, I just press really hard and hope that it, I've made it a bit thinner. So um, pinectomies are effective for um, the squamous cells on the pinna. And then squamous cell um, carcinoma in situ, also known as Bowen's disease. So this occurs on the head areas of the skin. Not as common as um, the sunlight induced one, but not that uncommon. And again, it's actually pretty um, responsive to strontium as well as Aldara or the Miquimod that I mentioned. Basal cell tumors are by far the way the most common um, cancer in cats, but it can resemble melanoma. So an aspirate or even just a punch biopsy is always recommended. So epidermal inclusion cysts. So these are these little sebaceous cysts or um, I've got a, a photo of this crusty old dog that had this one on the back of its head. Um, but on the cytology, you'll just get this extracellular debris in the background. They're normally floc floculent. They're really common in older dogs, and cytology is doc diagnostic. We tend to only take them off if um, they're ruptured. So sebaceous gland tumours can range anywhere from the benign to the malignant. Thankfully, the malignants are relatively uncommon. Um, the wart-like growths are probably the most common one we see, and they can be a problem if the, the dog needs to be groomed constantly, which is when they, they happen quite often. But again, you can do a cytology on that and, and pretty much confirm your diagnosis in-house. In Grossly, they usually are, are relatively distinctive, although I've had a few mast cell tumors look like adenomas, so I tend to aspirate everything, but that's mainly because I'm paranoid. Um, apocrine sweat gland cysts are those cysts that you feel under the skin, put a needle in. So I, most of my aspirates I start out with as um, capillary methods, so I don't have a syringe on the end of it. I just pop it into the lymph node or the mass that I'm feeling. And this is the one where I would put a needle into and it shoots you in the face, the stuff that comes out of it. Um, and usually you just drain them. Unless they're a problem, I, we don't take them out. Um, you can um, rarely get adenocarcinoma of sweat glands too. Perianal gland tumor is far more common in um, uncastrated males. If it's a castrated males, it, male, it's more likely to be, be an adenocarcinoma, um, but castration can be curative for this. And then round cell tumors. So the five sort of round, main round cell tumors we think of is mast cell tumor, histiocytomas, plasma cytomas, TVTs, and lymphoma. Plasma cytomas. So solitary plasma cytomas of the nail bed or of the oral cavity aren't multiple myeloma. We tend to stage them anyway, but I knock on wood, I've not had one ever be a systemic. Um, we talk about them as being relatively benign tumors, and by that I mean they're not metastatic, but they can still kill the dog because they're locally invasive. Um, TVTs are really interesting because they're actually a contagious cancer. So the other contagious cancer we have in this country is um, devil facial disease, the Tassie devil. So mast cell tumors can look like anything. Majority are actually normally on the trunk or extremities, and 14% of dogs that have one tumor have another one, so keep looking. In cats, they're um, normally around the head and neck. Histiocytomas, young dog, although any dog of any age can develop them. So even if it's a 12-year-old dog and you see something like this and you think, oh, it could be nasty, just aspirate it. It's probably still a histiocytoma. <clears throat> and they often spontaneously regress. Oh, and this is the example of that extramedullary plasma cytoma. So 
sure, this isn't going to metastasize, but this is going to cause a problem for the dog to eat. It's um, surgically curative, so a rostral mandibulectomy would cure this dog, and radiation, really radiation responsive. The problem with radiation in Sydney still is we don't have it. So um, they can go to Brisbane, but obviously that alone is a barrier to people, let alone the money. Um, so if anyone has $2 million spare, or 10 of you have $200,000 spare, come see me and let's build a bunker. So TVTs are sexually transmitted. As I said, we don't see them that commonly, but um, they can certainly look like lymphoma. And if you're not aware of a travel history and you get um, a, you take an aspirin or a biopsy and you haven't given your pathologist a heads up, they may well say it's a histiocytic variant of a lymphoma. Um, the really nice thing about TVTs is they're, they're curable with either vincristine or RT, and they can look really ulcerated or nasty. I've also had them in the eyes, um, and we assume that, and the nose, and that's mainly because of sniffing. And as um, Danny said, cutaneous lymphoma can look like atopy. So cutaneous lymphoma really can look like anything, and it's by probably by far and away one of the longest... Um, people actually have looked at time to diagnosis of this tumour type, and I would say it's one of our longest time to diagnosis. So it's, it's on average six to eight months, and that's because people uh, think it's a skin disease or bacterial infection for so long that lots of treatment trials before we do a biopsy. And finally, some mesenchymal tumours. So Lipomas are counted in this category as well as melanoma. So melanomas, you might see some pathologists, if I may get on my soapbox incorrectly, call them um, like a, a round cell melanoma or a melano um, of, of round cell origin, but really melanomas are actually neuroectoderms. So tr they're truly a sarcoma, even though they can look spindle they can look round and they can actually look epithelial. Lipomas are benign fatty, fatty tumours. Marginal resection is curative. Um, we don't generally go cutting them out until they become a problem. This dog obviously had a huge problem. It was like, look, it's a boy. <laughs> <coughs> so it would be nice to cut them out before they get to this point, but I've done the same thing. I've treated a dog with I can't remember what she had, the Cocker Spaniel that had um, melanoma, I think. So, of course, we thought she was not going to last much longer than a year, even with the therapy. She had a lipoma on her side, and sure enough, three years later, she has to have this huge surgery to get this lipoma that weighs the same as her off. Um, infiltrative lipomas are really interesting because um, they actually burrow in between the muscle fibres. So again, they don't usually metastasize. Liposarcomas can. Um, but it's kind of ironic when your, fat, your own fat starts killing you. Um, and on the CT scan, you can see these muscle striations through that fat just here in this section here. So CT scan is actually diagnostic. That's a picture of a CT scan. Um, and you, surgery is curative, but if you can't get margins, it's also responsive to radiation. And I've seen these actually even invade into and through the vertebra and into the spinal column, so they can be incredibly invasive. So hemangiopericytomas are a, a low-grade, usually low-grade soft tissue sarcoma, very commonly on the extremities, so on the limbs, um, locally infiltrative and hardly ever spread. So ideally surgical resection with wide margins. Because they are low-grade, some people will just keep chopping them off. The record I've seen was 25 times, but then it became the whole dog's leg, and they ended up amputating. But that did take five or six years, so the dog did have its limb for five or six years. And then fibrosarcomas can look very similar too. And as I was saying, <coughs> um, it's nice to get a, a actual grade on a fibrosarcoma because high-grade fibrosarcomas are more likely to metastasize. About 40% metastasize by a year. So it would be nice to know whether or not you're going to need to follow up with anything afterwards. And while we've always talked about wide local resection, amputation, or a local resection and radiation, 
Metronomic chemotherapy is also slowing down or at least delaying the reoccurrence of these, so that's been very helpful. So that's low-dose chemotherapy that the owners give at home. Usually has cyclophosphamide in the protocol. The bummer is that we don't truly know how long those owners should keep the dogs on it, so the dogs end up being on this low-dose chemotherapy for quite a long period of time. Hemangiosarcomas, um, subcutaneous especially, are nasty. Usually if they're dermal, you fix them. Um, if they're invading into underlying muscle, there's an increased risk of metastasis, and um, we usually follow with chemotherapy after surgery. This is just a couple of pictures of these little blood blisters, as well as a massive subcutaneous hemangiosarcoma. And again, radiation can be really helpful in these in these cases because you can at least downstage the disease. And by that I mean you actually shrink it before you do surgery. And this was a subcutaneous um, hemangiosarcoma that presented, we did a CT scan, unfortunately he already had diffuse pulmonary metastasis. And then melanomas are relatively, cutaneous melanomas are relatively uncommon in dogs. By far and away the majority are benign. Mitotic index we think is important anything over three, and it's a bit more concerning. Um, the digital and mucocutaneous junction um, have a much higher um, potential for metastasis. So they're the ones that we're actually um, advocating follow-up therapy for. So they're typically dark, where you can certainly get amelanotic melanomas. And they're really rare in cats, usually on the head and neck again. So you'd typically think this was even a basal cell tumour, so I would biopsy it. Um, metastasis is rel relatively common. We can use the canine melanoma vaccine in cats. There's been, um, because it's given via a sort of high pressure injector that goes dermally, you've got to be really careful when you're administering it, because um, in the States, at least with the feline Luke virus vaccine administered the same way, People have actually fractured the femur, which isn't ideal. <coughs> um, but I would just biopsy this, and then if it's not a basal cell, go from there. So then finally, cutaneous tumours can look like anything, and this turned out to be a lymphangiosarcoma. So this is actually a tumour of the lymphatics rather than blood vessels, so mangiosarcomas of blood vessels and lymphangiosarcomas of lymphatics. But they, they look very similar in histology, except there's no blood in the channels that are formed. And then that's it. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Thank you.